I'm not great at processing stress. You see, I, I learned early on that discussing a problem was worse than the problem existing. So I took that stress and I rolled it into a very healthy ball in my chest and I released it through games. As much as I could, at least. It turns out you have to deal with the source of that stress at some point or it never actually gets better. So as I got older, my coping mechanisms were tested and often failed. I'd have breakdowns that were drawn out and unproductive. I'd struggle to be honest with myself and I developed a cynical streak that I'm not proud of. By 2018, I made progress, but I wasn't ready to face the mortality of every parental figure I had at once. I'm not sure anybody gets ready for that. It started when my stepmom got a cancer diagnosis, shortly after my father was hospitalized with undiagnosed chest pain. And at the same time, my mom and stepdad were driven off the road into a ditch. They're still recovering from those injuries. I pulled back into myself for months. Most of my friends either knew nothing or very little about what was happening. I filled my time with mechanic-driven, endless games that I could zone out in. I wasn't playing to feel anything, I was playing to avoid feeling as much as I could. So I played Slime Rancher. I fell in love with farming games thanks to Harvest Moon 64. From my race car bunk bed, I could have a farm with a house and a family I chose, and a horse that I took to the races, and a chicken that died and legitimately ruined my week. As I grew older, I still played these games, but it got harder to buy into the world. I saw things more mechanically, and even though Stardew Valley is an incredibly calming experience, I wouldn't say I ever got immersed. When I was a kid, romancing Maria felt romantic. As an adult, forcing salads down Leah's throat to marry her as quickly as possible was entertaining, but not cathartic. And it's not Stardew Valley's fault, it's just that I changed. Chalk it up to cynicism, I guess. I came into Slime Rancher depressed and looking for that kind of detachment. It's a game where you explore the world to find different slimes that you raise on your farm so that you can make money and find more slimes, and it seemed like the kind of gameplay loop I needed to isolate myself in for a while. At the end of the day, that's what Zen games are isolation. It can be to pass time, to kill boredom, or to avoid the outside world. And while I spend an unfortunate amount of my time doing this, I never expect these games to talk to me about isolation. I stepped into the shoes of Beatrix LeBeau, who has left everything behind to take over a slime ranch. As I explored the far, far range, I came across hollow notes left by Hobson Twilger, the original owner of the ranch. They could be helpful, or funny, or pensive, and they were the closest thing I had to a plot. One of the best things about the writing, though, is although he talks quite a bit about himself, he leaves a lot of open ends for Beatrix. For you. The need to see what's around the corner is in my bones, and since you're out here, I reckon it's in yours too. Though I suppose you could also be out here because you like the fresh air, or you prefer the untamed beauty of this land. Or maybe it's because you're looking to leave something far behind you. Sure is the way to do it. Doesn't get much further than this. It's minor, it's optional, and your experience isn't any worse if you don't engage with it. But to me, it felt like an acknowledgement. These words clearly weren't meant for Beatrix. She's an avatar with no personality of her own. She expresses nothing. These conversations only function as a way to talk to the player. They ask things like, what brought you here? What's on your mind? Why have you taken yourself out of that world and put yourself into this one? That's a question that I ask a lot. I'm curious about the media we consume, but I'm more curious about why we consume it. Art serves no practical purpose, yet we create and consume it obsessively. It's one of the most interesting things humans do, and I think the more we understand it, the more we'll understand each other and ourselves. Why does the imagery of Treasure Planet pop into my head at night? Why is there a market for Todd Howard ASMR? In times of grief, why do I abandon friends and turn to video games? I've done it all my life. This was the first time a game called me out. I had a great big tree like this here one along the edge of my property back on Earth. It had been there before anyone could remember. It survived all kinds of change around it. And then one day, I began to notice it was dying. When I got the message about the cancer diagnosis, I was covering a shift at work. 
I went into autopilot, uh, withdrawing for the rest of the shift and just responding generically to my coworkers. And when the shift was over, I didn't leave. If I left, I had to call. And if I called, it became real. And if it was real, then I had to process and empathize and try to figure out how I'm supposed to respond to a situation like this. So for an hour, I ran scenarios in my head, looking for the perfect sentence to fix everything. And then I realized that if I didn't do something, I'd end up like that tree. I'd spend my whole life in the same place. I wasn't going to let that happen, so I bought a ticket for the far, far range the very next day. I had a talk with one of my coworkers, Kayla. She'd been through something similar. She told me I wasn't supposed to know what to do or say. I was just supposed to be there. My choice wasn't between saying the right thing or the wrong thing. It was between anything and nothing. So I finished my drink. I left. I called. And everything was okay. Sometimes you gotta choose one path or another and there's no way around it. But you know what? Either path you choose is gonna make you hurt some for want of walking the other. Life is filled with doors like these. As a kid, I struggled with choosing what to order at restaurants. I was worried I'd get the wrong burger or something. In a shocking twist, my choices are much more important as an adult. I'm increasingly aware of my ability to hurt people. I'm steadily learning that the assumptions I grew up with are often wrong, and that I know very little about most things. And I'm shown time and again that there's a wide gap between claiming a principle and practicing it. So when I come to those doors, all of these things weigh on me. That fear of doing the wrong thing, or the right thing in the wrong way. So, I isolate. I think. I play games. To a point that's healthy, I think. Figuring out where you stand before a big decision is important, but at some point you have to choose something. Inaction is its own choice. Don't let your fear of being wrong stop you from doing right. Keep moving. I wouldn't say Slime Rancher taught me this lesson. I wouldn't even say I've learned this lesson. I'm still learning it, and it's likely that I only got these things from this game because it was on my mind at the time. But when every day involved confronting concepts that scared me, Hobson's notes gave me words to hold on to, phrases I could use against that fear. It helped facilitate a dialogue that I needed to have with myself, and I appreciated that. But not as much as I appreciated their depiction of love. Throughout the game, you'll receive and read letters, and though you never see anybody in person, there are small storylines with characters like Mochi Miles that I think are legitimately well written, and like Hobson, explore the various reasons we become isolated. I would talk about them all, but I hope by talking about the one that meant the most to me, it might inspire someone watching this to discover the others themselves. You get the most letters from someone named Casey. One of B's friends from Earth, Casey's letters provide the only information about the life you've led back then. At first, it's just cute little stories and a bit of exposition. But over time, the depth of this relationship becomes more clear. Hi, B. The year we both came home, do you ever think it could have worked? I mean, being with you again every day instead of the long distance thing? That was great. I remember feeling really happy, but something was missing. This may come as a shock to you, as you've just been listening to me talk passionately about the themes of a Jello ghost busting game, but I'm a romantic. When I fall for somebody, it tends to be hard, and I have a very optimistic idea of what two people can be to each other. This makes the idea of letting go difficult. One of the lowest points of my life was the end of a six-year relationship, and when I think back to the downward spiral I let myself fall into, uh, despite knowing it hadn't even been a healthy relationship, I'm not proud. I learned a lot about myself in that time. How I used the relationship as a way to avoid personal growth. How I rarely asked what I actually wanted out of myself. How I had stopped moving forward for years. We both knew that we were giving up something for it all. I think about it all the time, that 
if we had just been less honest about it all, how you might still just be running that little garden shop and I'd still be writing music out of the basement. When all of this was happening, I had been in another relationship for a few years. I had grown a lot and it was healthy. We talked openly about things, including when we were unhappy. There were still highs and lows, but it felt different. We were listening and growing and challenging each other. But that year in particular was hard. Especially once I got the diagnosis, I started to isolate. And at the same time, she was having her own problems that she didn't know how to tackle. We were both in the process of examining the parts of ourselves we hated, and we had little energy left for anything else, including each other. She thought we'd be better off focusing on these things alone. A few years after the breakdown, and I've wound up at the same set of doors. This time, I wanted to do better. I know, it was the right thing to do, but it never felt the same as having you close by. London was an opportunity I couldn't pass up, an opportunity to tour and do what I love. But I still missed you like crazy, even before you were gone. <sighs> I guess that's just us. What we really want just so happens to be in different parts of the known universe. I mean, there's long distance and then there's being so far away that time itself might actually function differently. Why aren't there more songs about that, huh? I was sad when it was over. More sad and for longer than I was the first time. But I never stopped moving. I went through door after door and I found joy in that sadness. I owned my emotions and my decisions. I got stronger. I created things I was genuinely proud of. I became more of the person I saw when I closed my eyes. In the midst of all this emotional turmoil, I reached the end of Slime Rancher. I stood in the spot where Hobson had decided to move on. And I got one last letter from Casey. Hi, B. There's another tour coming up, but I have a feeling that this will be the one. Uh, so here I am, packing my bags and thinking of you. Maybe this is how it felt when you were leaving for your big adventure. Lots of excitement, lots of butterflies. And even though I know you're so far away, I keep thinking that maybe I'll catch you somewhere out there in the crowd. If that ever happens, I promise I'll sing a song for you. It wouldn't be the first time. Casey. Usually, when a story talks about love, it's about the lovers finding their way to each other. If it's tragic, perhaps there's an arc about having the strength to let go. But at this point in my life, when someone I loved had to deal with something that I was powerless to help with, Casey was the perfect example of love and practice. To look at somebody who they love, and to see that they need to go. That they're not fulfilled, that there's something they need somewhere else. And to not even know what that is. And to just say, I'll be here. I hope I see you again. That selflessness. That support. That's the love I want. I think there's a very toxic perception of love that I carried as this thing that you owe something to. Even though I knew that they were being honest about needing to work on these things alone, there was still that part of me that was ashamed that I couldn't be the one to fix it for them. I needed to have the shame taken out of the equation. I both needed to hear and say that it was okay to heal. That it is okay to take space for yourself. That you will not be loved any less. I had a year to think about things while you slapped your way across the stars. I, I think it almost scared me when things got easier, and when I finally realized that what we have now is what we wanted all along. Because if you're still the girl that I know, you're... you're happy out there on the very farthest frontier. And I hope the happiness that you feel now lasts forever. I hope that the sunsets over there are as gorgeous as they are over here. I'm glad to have shared a part of me with you, and I'm happy to know that maybe one of those stars I see up there in the sky is you.
Oh, please don't say that you'll go. My heart can't bear the news. Just knowing that you'll be a thousand light years away if you do. And will you know when it's through? When you find what you're looking for, will you know what to do? A thousand lives.